This is the first part of the Vivian tutorial where we deal with the the warping board. So first we will tie the thread we are using onto the first pin, usually on the top left corner. And one thing we need to determine is the approximate length of the weave you want to do. So normally for a weave around uh, two yard or so, we'll follow a simple V shape pattern on the warping board. So, but notice that there will always be around half a yard of uh, loom, uh, yarn waves on the loom because of the length you use to tie up the warps. So the pattern I'm following is um, first for the top, for the top row, you, you you will try to make a cross between the second and third pin. So I'll probably post a zoom in view of the cross, but in general, so we will go down. We we will, so there are first two half of the um, of each uh, turn. So first, this is the forward direction, and then you will go back. So when you are making the first turn. Uh, or the first half, you go below the third pin and above, sorry, you go below the second pin and above the third pin. And then you, so for all the other pin, it's pretty flexible, but here is a um, general route of the thread that we use, which I'll post it as an image. So depending on the width of the we the we are doing, for example, for the linen yarn, which is one of the most commonly used yarn in our lab, um, the EPI that we normally use is forty. So if we want to do a weave that is two inch wide, we will need eight. Uh, so for forty EPI to and two inch wide weave, we will have where we need eighty warp thread. So we will make 40 cycles in total on this warping board. And we also have two uh, salvages, on one on each side, which adds up to 82. So now I will finish doing the 82 warp thread in total. So this is a zoom in view of the cross I was talking about. So the left, the pin on the left is the second pin, where the yarn going from left to right is going below it and the same yarn then go above the third pin and when it goes back the yarn goes under the third pin on the right and then above the second pin on the left okay so the second part of the setting is to remove the the word from the working board and then to do that we need to tie on several parts of the word and this is the first one on the end of the working board. We can just make two tie to make sure it's secure. Okay, so this is the first knot. And then we need to do it around this crossing section. So since we have four parts here, so we need to do four knots. And you can use any kind of thread to do this. Since we are we will like just cut cut a knot off afterward, so it's fine. It doesn't need to be pretty tight. So the purpose of this is to make sure the verbs are separated from each other. So now we have tied the warps at five locations, one on uh, one on each branch of the cross and one on the other side. So now we'll gently move all the 
threads to the end of the pin so that it's easier to dig it out later. So we'll move all the threads to the end, or nearly close to the end. So to hold the, uh, to make sure that the order of the warp doesn't get messed up, we'll need to hold the cross with our hand. So if you're right-handed, I'll just use the, normally we'll just use the left hand. So we'll put the, put my um, fingers like that. So the middle finger will be above the cross while the two finger on the side will go inside the cross. And now you will just hold it like that so that the warp thread doesn't come out. And now we are ready to remove all the warps from the warping board and transfer it to the loom. Okay, so after we um, remove the warp from the warping board, now we are going to move it to the loom. And the first step of this is to measure a lens approximately equal to the bands from the reed here to the another side of the reed. And then this will be a good lens. So after that, we just roll the extra lens of the warp several times around this from reed. Or from beam of the... Oh, from beam, yeah. yeah. Where some also call it the breast beam. Rest Depending beam. on the which source you're looking at. Yeah, but you don't actually you don't need to tie it. You just leave it there, or you can use a. I think you should tie it. Do a. Yeah, a flat tie, like that. I think I let that hand go. Actually, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. So now. But you still need to hold it in your hand, mm. and then. Now we are going to slay the reed. Yeah. You should probably move all the warp to the right side just to make it easy to yeah for yeah. later. Okay. So now the warps yarns are already warped around the um, the front beam of the loom. So we have cut all the white yarns that we use to tie the warps as well as cut the end of the front loose. As you can see here. And so now we will dress, uh, we will slay the reed by putting, putting the warp yarn through the reed in front of me. So the reed we are using is a is 20 dent, 20. which means that there are 20 slots per inch on this reed. So when we are pulling the warp yarn from the hand, from my hand, we we'll always pick the yarn that is on the very top. That's why we have a cross so that the intersecting yarn can indicate the, the order when it was on the warping board. So now I will pick up the first yarn. So since we will have a uh, salvages on each side, the first one will just be a single yarn. And since we are doing a two inch wide weave, we'll first locate the center and then just about to go go to the left for about one inch and then this is this is a tool that we use to pull the thread through the reed we'll have a different tool for the for putting it through the handle but we'll cover it in the next part so first we'll put the yarn hook from the other side of the reed and then put the yarn through the hook and then pull it through the reed and if you're doing it by yourself, you can just leave it hanging for now and deal with the other part. Or if you're working in pairs, which is better, the other person can pick the can pick up the yarn on the other side. And now, since we are since we are doing 40 EPI, there will be two yarn in each slot. So normally, what we do is that we will pick up two yarn, two warp yarn from my hand and then put it through the next adjacent dent on the reef. And I'll do two more.
So now we will switch to the other side. So on the other side of the loom, which is the back beam, the other person will pick up the the warps, the warp yarn from the reed. So notice that the first one, which is the uh, flying salvages, it will be floating without going through any handles. And normally we, are, we only use the first four shaft for most of our weave. So we will pull out one handle from each shaft and then we will follow We'll pull the warp yarn through the handles following the order one, two, three, four, which refer to the number of the shaft. So for the for the next two yarn, we'll we'll start with the first uh, from the first shaft, which is the furthest from the from my side. And this is the tool we'll be using to pull the yarn through the handle. So we first for the we use a small or the thinner, thinner end of the tool. We first pull it, put it through the handles and then use a hook to put the yarn through it. And then we can leave the uh, leave the warps on the roller on the back and we'll do the same thing for the uh, for the second yarn. So after I'm done with this step, the person on the other side can put the next two warps through the reed, which again I will pick up on my side and put put it and put it through the um, handle number uh, on the shaft three and four. So now I pick up the next two. Yeah, for the third thread. I will pull, pull it through the handle on the shaft number three and the same for the shaft uh, number four. And now I've covered the both sides and we will repeat this process for a lot more times and which will give us uh, the setup for a complete two inch wide weave. And after you are done with the group of four handles, you can pull it to one side so that it's easier to organize. So we are now done with um, putting the warp yarn through the reed. So this is on the front side. As you can see, there's around two inches of warps, 82 yarns in total. And now on the back side, we have the yarn approximately split it in half so one inch on each side and this at the moment this is hanging over the back beam so after we stain the reeds and threading through the handles now we are going to tie the yarns on the back beams so um the first thing to do is to unroll the back road here over here and then how we set it up is like um putting it below the back beam and then go over it. So now um, we need to adjust the lens. So now it's equally um, in, in the middle between the, the uh, shaft and the back beam. And the next step is to tie the yarns on the back road. So normally we will separate um, the yarns into multiple branches Depend, depends on the dance um, you're having with your weave. So, so right this now time we have a two inch wide weave. So we have we only have one branch for each inch. inch. So we have two branch. Yeah. And then when you are tying it, we will separate each branch into two branch, two branches like that. Two branches with equal amounts of the yarn maybe slightly more to the left okay but this won't matter that much as long as the tie is secured okay so we do it like that have the two branches
So now we do the first tie. So that for the first tie, you have to push it hard to make sure the first tie is really tight, like that. And then we do the second one. This is how we secure the yarns on the back road. And then you can check if the tension is even on this branch. If it's good, then we can move on to the second one. Basically, it's the same procedure. You make the first tie. Pull it to the end. Yeah, so now we finished the tie. And you can trim the extra dance if you want. So now we're ready to set up the other side of the of the loom or the front beam. So first, since we have rolled the the extra warp uh, on the front beam, we'll unroll it now. So again, this process is better done with two person, one on each side. So right now I'm on the side of the front beam. So as you can see, we have the two inch of warp through the ready through the handle. So the person on the other side will start to roll the back beam slowly and gently, and the and I will put my finger through the other warp thread and beat, beat it, beat it, and come through it so that to make sure so to make sure that there's no entanglement both at the handles and at the reed. So this process should be repeated while the warp is being pulled through the handles and the reed. So when you find uh, entanglement in the entanglement in the warp thread, normally it can be uh, resolved by combing and beating. But the the entanglement will accumulate towards the end. But in this case, you can just cut the extra warps away. Now I'll switch to the other side. Also, notice that always you 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 for the person on the front beam, you also, you all, you always need to put all the yarns in tension. But the amount of tension will depending on the type of yarn you're using for. Then it's pretty strong, so you can put a lot of force on it. So now we are showing the view on the other side or the back beam. Again, I'm still on the front beam holding, putting all the warp yarn in tension. And there is a roller on the right side of the loop. You can either directly turn the back beam or turn the rod or turn the roller. So now after the rod reaches the roller, you you will need to insert cardboard between the roller and the warp yarn so that the tension on all the warp yarns are even out and there also will be no entanglement between different layers of the warp as it is being rolled onto the roller. So now we will continue the process of combing, beating and now the warp yarns are being rolled onto the cardboard. And now we're, when we reach the end of the first cardboard, we'll ju we can just insert another one. So we just finished rolling the yarns, go to the back bin. And now we are going to tie the warp to the front bin. So as you can see here, there are several knots and entanglements after this section, so we are going to cut it first. Now we are good to tie it on the front road. Okay, so it's the same setup. So you make it below the front pin and then go over it. Maybe you can release the pin first yeah. to on the other side. Okay. So that the the beater or the reed is further away from the yeah from from the 
Yeah. Separate it to two branches. Okay. First. Very tight. First tie. First knot. And then we do it again. So we are doing the second half or the other groups. You need to make sure that the tension among all the warps are approximately the same. To achieve that, you can put your hand on the back side of the loom and feel if the tension are even among all the warps. So before you make the second knot, you can adjust the tension like that. So you can feel it if the tension is balanced on both branch. So now I feel this is much looser than the right side. So I'll take it back a little bit. Or you can also undo this part to make sure the tension is balanced. Yep, so now it's similar in tension. So we can do the second one now. Okay, so the last step of uh, dressing a loom is to use the tissue to uh, even out the tension. And eventually we want to see the verbs goes in parallel to each other and then it will tie it to the close to the front rod. So what we are going to do is to prepare the tissue. So normally we will have the lens of tissue um, like that, two segments, and then we fold it twice into this rectangle shape. And then we are going to use um, very similar to plan weave. Um, so, so first, let's say we have the one and three draft uh, raised, and then we put the tissue in between. And for the savages, um, we can alternate the position. For example, in this one, I'll put the salvages below the tissue. And then I switch it to two and four. Put another tissue into it. And this time, the savages should be on top of the tissue. So that's how we set up. One row. After you have two or three tissue in between the, the verbs, you can build it. So you can see now it's going to be more parallel for the verbs. So you can repeat the same steps until all the, the verbs have even tension and they are parallel to each other. After finishing the paper tissue, um, we're going to show another way to, to even out the tension. So we will use a thicker cotton wire, cotton yarn. And we will still use the plan we pattern because it's simple um, to do the uh, steps. So now we're going to raise the one and three shafts. So the thicker yeah. cotton yarn helps out to even out the tension even better. Before we continue the the actual weave with a thinner or finer yarn.
now you can check if the tension is good and the warps are in parallel to each other. So now we have a zooming view of the yarn. As you can see, uh, both within the tissue paper and on the thick cotton yarn, the spacing between the warp thread becomes more even further on. Yeah. And you can continue this process until the spacing between the yarn is good enough. Now that we have finished setting up the loom, I will briefly go over each major components of our floor loom before we dive into the detail of um, the weaving techniques. So this is a floor loom that we'll be using in the lab. This is a beater, and in the middle of it is a 20 dent reed, which means that there are 20 slots per inch. And we use the beater to push the weft yarns into the finished fabric, which is held here. And this is the front beam, the back beam. And on each side, there is also a roller. This is the front roller or the cloth roller. And this is the back roller, which is the, also called the warp roller. So on each of the front and back rollers, there is a mechanism that holds them in tension. So in the, on the front roller, there is a racket, which is uh, on the right side. And there are two um, handles. The first one is a stopper and which uh, normally put the front beam in tension. And there is also a handle which allows you to manually turn the front beam, but only in one direction. And on the side of the back beam, there is a roller, uh, which also only turns the beam in one direction. And of course, you can also directly turn the, beam, the roller itself, which shouldn't require too much force. And so normally both of the front and back roller are fixed and the two mechanisms hold some tension. But if we want to move the uh, move the walls forward or backward, we can loosen one of them. For example, if we want to move the whole uh, warp yarns forward, for example, when we already have enough section of finished fabric on the front and we want, we want to move the lip uh, or lose some more space for new weaves, we will need to move the whole fabric forward. To do that, we will, uh, for, due to, for to do that, we can loose up the back beam. There is a paddle that can connect to the, there's a paddle on the right most that is connected to the back roller via a string. So, if we step on that paddle on the rightmost, we will be able to turn the uh, to turn the front beam or sorry the front roller freely, either directly by hand or using the handle, which can engage the bracket. And we will, when we have enough length or enough loose up enough free space, we can tighten up the warp yarn again by keep turning the um, racket or keep turning the front beam without loosening up the brake. And alternatively, if we want to move the whole section backward, to do that, again, we will loose up the, we will disengage the brake. And then we can freely roll back the warp yarn using the roller on the back side. Again, if we and when we are done, we can re-engage the paddle or re-engage the brake and then tighten up the warp tighten up the warp yarn either using the either either on the side of the front beam or the back beam. And lastly, now I will again I will try to move the warp into a suitable position. And now this uh, this is the main the forum we have has eight shafts, which are the frame that holds the uh, handles, which in which the warp yarns go through it, and there are eight shafts in total. And the forum we have also have ten straddles, which are the paddles on the bottom, and 
the paddles are or the straddles are connected to the shaft through the cable here, and so those cable allows each uh, straddle to connect with multiple shafts, as well as allow a single shaft to connect to multiple straddles. And right now, the first two, the first four shafts are connected to the four straddle in the middle, which I labeled with um, different number of electric blue electric tape. So when we step on the first, second, and third, fourth straddle, the shaft number one, two, three, and four will rise up respectively. So now I'm going to show how to prepare the wax yarns. There are a couple of tools that we need. The first one is the shuttle, and set the second thing is the bobbin, which goes into the shuttle and also holds the web yarns. So I'm going to use the, uh, the blue silk yarn. So first, we will, so this is a winder that we'll use to roll the web yarns or a roller and we first will put the bobbin through the shaft on the winder and now we'll put the the silk yarn we'll be using on the floor approximately directly below the bobbin and then we'll make a simple knot just one, one or two knot will be enough we just need to have enough friction on the put enough friction between the yarn and the bobbin. And while we are winding the yarns, while we are winding the yarns, we will try to put enough, uh, we will try to evenly distribute, distribute the yarns among the bobbin. So the first and most simple weave technique that I will show is plain weave. So now we have the shadow and the the bobbin that has webbed yarn on it. We'll put it through the shaft in the middle and push the webbed yarn through the hole or slot on the side and pull it out. And now we are ready to weave. So. First, we'll need to adjust the tension on the warp. The way we will do that is, first we can adjust the position of the, of the yarn, and then we can increase the tension until when we raise up the shaft, the yarn, the web that has been raised up has enough tension on it, and now we're ready to go. So uh, from now, I will refer to uh, either shaft 1, 2, 3, 4 or paddle or straddle 1, 2, 3, 4. They are used interchangeably and they mean the same thing, which means that when mentioned to raise to raise the first shaft, I also mean to step on the first paddle or straddle, which I had labeled already. So as you can notice, there are two flying salvages on the side and we, ha we have also mentioned it while dressing the loom, one on the right and one, one on the left. So those are used to hold the edge of the weave. For p um, to make sure that the weft or the weft yarn will go through them uh, on different, on different sides when you are going from left to right versus right to left. We, um, we will need to go below and above it um, and, and alternatively each turn. So for example, we can always go below the we can always go below the salvages on the side that you are putting the shuttle through and go above the um, salvages on the other side. So for example, if we, I prefer to go always go from starting from the right side because I'm right-handed, and so now first we'll put the shuttle through the 
or sorry, below the the salvage on my side and above the salvage on the other side. And I will put through put it through, and we can just leave enough uh, length of the uh, of the web yarn on one side so that it doesn't get pulled through completely. So now we are ready to ready for the next cycle. So now, so right now I'm stepping on uh, thread of one and three, and now we will change to two and four and beat it. So now when we are going from left to right, again we will go below the salvage on the side of the shadow, which is left now, and then go above the salvage on the right. So for all the other yarns, we will always um, go below the warp yarn that, that has been raised up. And now notice that in order to prevent tension to build up in the weft yarn and when that happens the the weft the, the whole section will shrink because the weft yarns get tighter and tighter. So to prevent that we're always leaving some extra length by making a small heel shaped pattern. So you can see there's a small doom in the middle. And then we'll shift the shaft to one and three and beat it. And now we are going from again without switching the um, a straddle, which means that which is on shaft one and three. We again we go below the right salvage and above the left, and switch to straddle two and four, and beat. And again, when we are going from left to right, we go below the left and above the right salvage. Push pedal and beat. Notice that um, please be relatively gentle when you are stepping on this pedal, as well as um, as well as beating the web. Because we are normally in our lab, we are working with we with a relatively small width, normally from two to four inch. If you are working with a say a longer or wider width, you can beat it slightly harder, but if you are beating too hard, you might break the warp. You might break the warp, especially if you are working with more fragile yarn such as silk. And now I will show the finished section. Now we have finished a couple of inches of plain weave. The next weaving technique I will show is twill weave. So in twill weave, now remember that we have shaft one, two, three, and four. In twill weave, um, adjacent adjacent shaft will be raised. For example, we will first raise shaft one and two, and then two and three, three and four, and then back to one and four. So for example, if we We'll first step on thread of one, two, and then the, in the next cycle, we'll go, we'll step on two and three, and then three and four, and then back to four and one, and then repeat this cycle. Of course, you can go both direction, and if you go a single direction as our first, as what I will show now, for example, if you I will first step on thread or one and two and then we we see a similar technique as a plain weave and now we are at the left left side of the weave we'll step on two and three and then beat and then when we are now we go from left to right and now we'll switch to three and four and then beat again Now when we are going from right to left, and now again we will switch to one and four and beat. And now after we go in to the left, now we are going back to uh, one two, and we can beat again. 
And now we are, I will repeat this process. One and two. Two and three. Three and four. One and four. Back to one and two. I'll show you one more time. One, two. Two, three. Three, four. Four, one. Back to one, two. So now we can also go to the other direction. So if you keep going in this order, you will have a pattern that is approximately 45 degree to both the weft and, and warp. However, if you want to have a zigzag pattern, you can just simply and go in the other order. For example, right now I'm on one, two. I'll do one more one, two. And now instead of going to two, three, I'll go back to four, one. And now from 4-1, after we are done with this turn, we'll go back to 3-4. And now 2-3. And now back to 1-2. And now we're at one two, we'll go to four one. Three four. Uh, and three two. Now we're at back to one two. Okay, now I'll repeat this cycle a couple of more times and you'll be able to see the zigzag pattern in the end. So now we're done with 12 weave. The next weaving pattern I will introduce is double weave. Double weave, as its name suggests, consists of two layers of plain weave. So therefore, in theory, each plain weave only need two shafts. You might notice that we are, we are using four shafts right now. So when we are doing plain weave, we, we raise two shafts at the same time. We, are, we have four shafts, one, two, three, four. For double weave, one layer will use shaft one, three, and the other will use layer two, four. So once, once, for example, if we have one, three as the top layer, remember for plain weave, but now we will only use shaft one, and we follow the same pattern with for with the salvages we go below the salvage that is closer to us and above the one on the other side so now we're done with the uh, right to left when we are going from left back to right we will now we'll use shaft three and we beat again and then we go from left to right so now we're done with the top layer uh, for for a single for a single cycle, and now we are we want to go to um, shaft two and four. However, if we want to go between shaft two and four, we need to raise the top layer as well. Which means that in addition to raise shaft two, we will also raise shaft one and three. So when we are working on the bottom layer, we we need to first step down one, two, and three at the same time, and then we beat. And now we go from right to left, and in a, in a similar way as the top layer. And now when we are going from left to right, 
we need to uh, raise pedal four. However, we also need to raise pedal one, three, and four. One, one, three. So in total, we are raising one, three, and four. And I will go through the same pattern two more times. One. Right now we are on top layer. Three. One, two, three. Now we are on bottom layer. One, three, four. Back to one. Three. One, two, three. And one, two, one, three, four. And now we should be back to one. So before this recording this clip, I've, I've already worked on a couple of cycles. So now when you raise the shaft one and three, in other words, the top layer, you can see that we are we are forming a, a two distinct layer. As you can see, I'm putting my finger between the two layers, and the two layers are connected on the on both sides via the salvages. So that's why the where salvages become an important part of our weave. So there are three young emanations for a for the double weave. So in the first one, we are using a single weft yarn and hence a single shuttle for both layer. And for the next two types, I will be using two different shuttles. So now, as you can see, I have two shuttles, one for the blue silk yarn that we prepared earlier, and the other is the same black silk yarn. So now we'll be so for the second type of double weave, we will weave the two layer with two different yarns. So now I'm using the blue silk yarn for the top layer, in other words, the layer with shaft one and three. So this is very similar with uh, what we were doing with just the black yarn, but now we are working with two types of yarn. But the order of the petal is, uh, is exactly the same. So now first we will raise shaft one and weave with the blue yarn, with the blue silk yarn. And we will be. I will switch to pedal three and beat. And again from left to right with the blue silk yarn. And now again we are on pedal one, two, and three, similar with similar to before. But now we are switching to the black silk yarn, which is used for the bottom layer. And now we're switching to pedal um, one, three, and one, three, and four. And now back to one. And since the pedal of pedal order is mostly the same, I will just do two more, two more cycles for demonstration. Now with the blue yarn on shaft one, switch to shaft three. Um, now on um, one, two, and three, switch to the black yarn. One, three, four. Back to one. Switch to the blue yarn. Shaft three. One, two, three. Switch to black yarn. Also, one, two, three. And now, to back to one, three, four. I'm going from left to right. Back to right.
And now when with the top layer, in other words, the layer with blue silk, you can see that the two layers are still separated in the middle, but connected on the two sides. Now for the last type of double weave, we are going to weave to um, two completely separate layers. So you might notice that in the previous two types, the two layers are both connected on the two edges via the salvages. So now, so now we'll try to weave two separate layers. So in order to do that, uh, we'll start with the top layer again. So, so for this part, the two layers cannot be connected via the salvages. So for the top layers, we'll completely ignore the two the two salvages on the on the sides. By for example, we can for the top layer, we can always go above the two salvages instead of going above and below alternatively so now we are back on three again when we are going from left to right we are, go up, we are going to go above both salvages and now again we switch to one two three and switch to back to the black silk yarn and now We'll, we'll, we'll weave the bottom layer the same as before. We first go below the salvage and then above it. Now one, three, four, and again below and above the salvages. Now we're back to one. So the process is mostly the same, but you need to make sure that the two uh, yarn doesn't entangle at the end, which will cause them to be combined to a single layer, uh, or makes them combine or makes them connected on the edge. So again, we are on the top layer, on petal one or thread one, go above both subjects. Three, above both again. Now back to one, two, three. bottom layer. Now we are going below and above. Switch, switch to 1, 3, 4. Below and above. And now I'll do it one more time. So the way to prevent them to entangle is one way to do it is to always rotate them in the same direction. It's probably hard to describe by words, but you'll get you'll get the hang of it after you practice for a bit. Now, on um, shaft three, go above both salvages for the bottom layer. Now we are on one, two, three, below and above, and then above. Now, the last one is one, three, four. Again, below and above the salvages. So now, when we are, so now when we switch, when we raise the top layer by stepping on thread one and three, we can see that the two layers are now separated on both sides. So the last technique that I will be showing is called supplementary work. So this is not a weaving pattern, but rather a way of incorporating different warp materials after you have set up the main warp yarns. So the, one, the material that we'll be using today is the, it's a 36 gauge copper wire, which is a pretty common conductive material for incorporating circuit traces into the weave. So first we will wrap the copper wire around the T-pin the copper wire will f follow the same path of a normal warp yarn. Of course, you can reserve a opening for the or reserve a um, handle in one of the shafts before um, while well, you are dressing up the loom. But we found it easier that you can just add a conduct or add a supplementary warp following the exact same path as one of the um, already set up warp yarn. So, for example, if we want to uh, make the copper wire go through the same path as a 
I see you work beyond in the middle of shaft three. So now I pick up, we have and raise the shaft three, number three, and identify the yarn I want to align with. So now I'll insert, I'll insert the T pin into the weave at approximately the same location as the warp I want to use. And then I put this through the weave a couple of times. And then push it all the way through. And now, at the other end of the copper wire, I have tied it to a uh, sewing needle. As you can see here. And I will, with the yarn I have ident identified previously, which is this one. And I will put it through the same dent. and pull it through. And the next step would be to put it through the same handle as well. So now I will put the end of the other end of the copper wire which is connected to tied to a needle through the corresponding handle on shaft three and pull it all the way through. So now I've put the couple of wires through the handle and we're at the back side of the loom. So as you can see, I'm holding the couple of wire in my hand. It will go over the back beam, similar as all the other warp yarn. And now we need to tension the couple of wire. So the way we are going to do it is through an additional weight hanging at the bottom. There's two ways that we normally do it. We can use either use a film canister and open it and there's a, there will be a quarter in it or you can put some other weight in it and then we'll grab the copper wire put it um, put it over the opening and then clip the cap back on and it will hold it will hold and tension the copper wire nicely and the other way we can do it is through an alligator clip you can pick the larger size so that it's weight approximately the same and you can just clip it over the copper wire and hang it and notice that when you are working with multiple supplementary warp you need to make sure that they do not entangle at the back or else they will create additional tension which might uh, break the material depending on how weak they are so after you are done with setting up the supplementary warp it's always helpful to go back and check whether it is correct. So now when I step on thread number three, and I can see that the copper wire rise up to, uh, together with the rest of the warp yarns. And I can also see that it also goes through the handles correctly. This is the end of the weaving tutorial. We hope that you find it helpful. Enjoy weaving.